I do hope you have your Bibles. If you do, Colossians chapter 3, beginning with verse 15, as we make our way through this book of Colossians, we come to a passage. It's short. It's only three verses, but it's very needed today. And I think it'll be very helpful to you. So if you have your Bibles, I, I do hope that you turn there. But I want to start by saying we live in a world of unrest, don't we? And actually, I don't know what comes to mind, but I'm not talking about San Bernardino, or I'm not even talking about Paris. I'm not talking about ISIL or ISIS, although there are many people we know who would love to destroy the American way of life and really actually, well, destroy Christianity. But I'm not really talking about that. I'm not talking about North Korea or Russia, although we realize there's much going on there that we don't appreciate. I'm talking about the fact that most people have very little peace in their lives. But we live in a, a world of problems. Many of those are our, of our own making. Most people are struggling. If we look around in the world in which we live, we realize, well, crime seems to be on the increase. And morality seems to be on the decrease. We can look around and see all kinds of problems. Problems with drugs or sex or alcohol, scandals. We can look around and we see police shootings. And they trouble us. Or we look at politics. Don't get me started there and things that are going on, but a lot of things, a lot of unrest. But the truth of the matter is, unrest is not just out there in the world in which we live. For most of us, there's unrest here. We've got all kinds of problems, and again, sometimes they're of our own making, but ask most people, and peacefulness really is not the word they'd use to describe their life. If you talk about things going on and what's happening, they probably don't list that in the top 10, or maybe it doesn't even make the list, because most people, and how about you, most people feel stress. Most people are burdened. Many people are tired. They're busy. If we went around and took a poll, there are many of you here that are facing all kinds of ravages. Maybe it's sickness or health issues. Maybe it's financial issues, death in the family, all kinds of struggles and burdens. And again, we don't feel a lot of peace because we live in a hectic world. But I am going to suggest to you that Jesus speaks to us in that hectic world, and the words he gives, well, they're rather comforting. Uh, for example, let's notice John chapter 14 and what Jesus says. Jesus says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. I want to tell you, those words are helpful, aren't they? Jesus wants to give us peace. He wants to bring comfort. Let not your heart be troubled. Jesus says, I want to give you peace. Not peace like the world talks about, but I do want to give you peace. Or I love what Paul says in Philippians chapter 4. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Some translations say, a peace that patheth, pass, I can't even say it, passeth understanding can guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And maybe I should just start by saying, does anybody need a dose of peace? In a troubled world where things seem to be going awry, where there's all kinds of problems and turmoil, and we look around, and sometimes we don't like what we see, Jesus says, I've come to give you peace. A peace that will guard your hearts and minds. A peace will come and bring you comfort, and it'll help you in a very troubled world. Well, in the same way, Paul wants to talk about the peace that is available in Christ Jesus. Paul wants you to know peace. We've already started with Paul saying, there's some things you need to put off in your life, and there's some things you need to put on, but ultimately he's going to say, here's what you need. You need Jesus, and he need, you need Jesus in your life, and so he wants us to know peace, and that's where we find ourselves in our, our, our passage in Colossians. So again, I hope you have your Bibles. If you do, I want to start with verse 15. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Paul's going to give us some instructions and say, in Christ, here's things that need to be evident in your life. And one of those things he wants you to have, he wants to have you a peace, a peace that comes from knowing Christ. And he's going to say, if you're clothed with Christ, these things should happen in your life. And the first thing he tells us is he tells us, he says, let the peace of Christ rule in your life. Notice the, the language here. Let the peace of Christ rule. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the peace of Christ rule in your life. Now, like I normally do, I've got to stop and give you a couple grammar lessons. Uh, the, the first grammar lesson is this. So I need to make two statements. We read that phrase, and let the peace. I've got to stop and say, this isn't a suggestion. 
Actually, in Greek, this is an imperative. That means this is a command. When we read the phrase, and let, it kind of seems like this is optional. Like, here's what maybe you should do. But in Greek, that's not what it says. Actually, a better translation for both this verse and the next one, they're commands. And so it says, the peace of Christ must rule in your hearts. It must rule. Now, an interesting word. We've seen it before. This word rule, it's actually the word umpire. Before, we found out there were false teachers teaching in Colossae and Paul said, don't let them serve as umpire against you, these false teachers. Now it's used in the positive. Here's what should umpire over your life. Here's how your decisions should be guided. Here's what should be helpful to you. The the, the peace of Christ must serve as your umpire. It it must rule over you, and so it's not optional. So realize this is a command. The peace of Christ must rule over you. Now the second grammar thing I want to point out is the language changes here. It changes from second person to to third person. Now, let me just explain that to you. Previously, he said, if you've died in Christ and you have, there are things that you need to put off in your life. And so put off these things. Now, not, not by yourself. I'm not suggesting that. He's saying, here's the things you must put off in your, in your life. You must put off the old self. And so he's talking about things like rage and malice and filthy talk. He he's said, here's things, if you're a Christian, and you are, if you've died to Christ and you have, you've got to put off the old self. And so you must put off these things. And he lists a bunch of those for us. Now, In the place of those things, he's also said, here's some things you must put on in your life. And so you need to put on love and compassion and humility, and you need to put those things on because you've died to your old self. But notice the language. Here are things you must put off, and here's things you must put on with God's help. That's that's second person. But now the language changes, and I don't want you to miss it. When he says, you must put the peace of Christ on, it's not second person any longer. It's third person. It doesn't say, it does not say you must be peaceful. But what it says is, let the peace of Christ rule in you. And the language changes. This is not something you do. This is something that Christ wants to help you do. This is something Christ will do in you. And so this is a command. You must let the peace of Christ, that must rule in your life. Well, how in the world does that happen? And again, I've got to bring you back to this word umpire. The peace of Christ should serve as your umpire. The, the, the peace of Christ should be your guiding principle. The peace of Christ should be the determining factor. No matter what goes on in the world around you, here's how you should view things with the peace of Christ. You must be characterized by the peace of Christ, and that peace of Christ is supposed to affect you. No, no, no stronger. It must affect how you act and how you react. It must be evident in your life. And as he talks about the peace of Christ, he's going to mention three areas in which that works. And I don't want you to miss this. Let the peace of Christ rule where? Well, it says in your hearts. He's going to talk about this internal peace. The peace of Christ it is an internal peace. It must rule in your hearts. You know, as we, we look around at the world we live in, there are all kinds of problems and struggles. We know that. But we realize the peace of Christ will allow us to deal with difficult times. The peace of Christ, if it's living in us, it will help us cope and it will help us deal with issues around us. Now understand, this peace we misdefine. This peace is not the absence of strife. This peace is not the absence of, uh, of conflict or pressure. But there is a peace that prevents you from caving in when the world caves in around you. This type of peace is going to enable you to look around and even though things are falling apart, you'll be satisfied that God's still in charge. You realize God's got bigger plans, and no matter what happens, we can still have a peace of Christ in our hearts. It's an internal peace. It's it's the fact that no matter what happens, we realize God is in charge. It's contentment. It's fulfillment. It's not based on circumstances. Now, I bet you've known people, haven't you, that no matter what happens, they seem to have this calm? Have you known people that it seems like their life is falling apart? It may be sickness or death or trial or tragedy or some kind of hardship. You know people like that, and yet even in the midst of that, they seem unshaken. Do you know people like that? Where does that come from? I'm going to suggest to you, for a Christian, it comes from knowing Christ. There's this secret of inner peace. It's it's the, the fact that we realize that Jesus, well, he is in control, and Jesus, no matter what happens, he can bring good from bad. In fact, Paul tells us that elsewhere. We read in Romans chapter 8, we read these words. We know that for those who love God, All things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. He doesn't say that everything will be good, but he does promise that God can even bring good out of a bad circumstance. We know that Christ is still in charge and Christ is still in control, and we realize that he knows what he's doing. And so even when it seems from our perspective that life's falling apart, do you think God's purposes have been defeated? Of course not. We can rest assured we can have this internal peace 
but things are okay. God's still in charge. I, I, I love also what Paul says in Philippians chapter 4. He says this, not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. The Christian has this, this understanding. I've got what I need in Christ Jesus. I've learned the secret of being content in any circumstance because I realize we serve a great God, and Jesus, well, I realize what he's done for us. So no matter what happens, I can still have this internal peace. No matter what happens, I can have confidence. No matter what happens, I can have security in Christ Jesus. I can have comfort in him. And that's a great thought. And Paul says, you must, you must let this peace of Christ rule in your hearts. There's this internal peace. But, it, but he talks more about that than just internal peace. It's also an external peace. We have the peace of Christ ruling in our hearts, but it affects how we deal one with another. And so we realize he's also talking about external peace. You are called in one body to peace. You see, this peace of Christ that rules in our hearts also should rule in our relationships one with another, in, the, in, in one body. And so we realize Christ's peace will help our relationships. It will help us effectively deal with other people. In fact, it will even help us, if we have the peace of Christ living in us, it will even help us in difficult circumstances with difficult people. I'm glad we don't know any of those, right? Difficult people. If you have the peace of Christ, it also will affect your relationships. Now, this peace, this peace of Christ doesn't mean we won't have differences of opinion, or this peace of Christ doesn't mean we, we won't have hardships with one another. It doesn't mean that all our difficulties will be eliminated, but as Christians, we realize the peace of Christ should work in us and through us, and it should affect those relationships even though they're difficult. As Christians, we can work together despite our differences, and this type of love, it's not a feeling, it's actually a decision. We know the peace of Christ, it's inside of us, and because of that, we can try to work through difficult circumstances with difficult people. It's this decision to allow the peace of Christ to rule over us. And I've got to stop and ask you a question. Maybe you can think about a hardship. Maybe you can think about a difficult person. Maybe you can think about a, a trying situation. What if the peace of Christ was really ruling in your hearts, and what if you allowed that to affect that situation, this choice to allow Christ's peace to rule that relationship, that Jesus Christ is going to be the umpire? How would that change things? Well, if we had the peace of Christ, we realize, well, here's what that looks like. We, we, we see a glimpse of this in 1 Corinthians. What would happen even in our difficult circumstances? And we read Paul again. He says, love is patient and kind. It is not envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices with truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Or some Bibles say love never fails. See, if we have the, uh, the peace of Christ, and he actually says we must have the peace of Christ. It's got to be ruling in our hearts and as it rules in our hearts, it's also going to serve as umpire in our relationships, especially one with another. And so he says, you must, you must have the peace of Christ. It must rule in your hearts and in your relationships one with another. And so it's an internal peace, which also becomes an external peace. But I, I've got to go one step farther. This internal peace, having the peace of Christ in your hearts, and this external peace, which affects your relationships, is only possible if you realize eternal peace. But the peace of Christ rule in your hearts and your minds. As you deal one with another, and I want you to notice, and he says, and be thankful. In fact, what you need to realize is he says this in every verse. As we go down through this passage, he's telling us you've got to have, you must have a thankful spirit. And so he says it in verse 15. I don't know if you picked up on this, but notice, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts and be thankful. You see that, right? We get to the very next verse. We haven't got there yet, but I've got to point it out to you. Verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you with thankfulness. And Verse 17, and whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, doing what? Giving thanks. Here's my question. Giving thanks for what? Well, that's the book of Colossians. I've got to remind you. The book of Colossians is about the eminent of Christ, that Christ is in charge, that he's Lord above all, that Jesus Christ loved you so much that he came and he died for you and he reconciled you, he redeemed you, he purchased you, that because of Jesus Christ, you now have a relationship with God. And so we realize we've died to our old self and we put on our new self and everything changes. 
And so now we realize who Christ is and what he's done for us. Now that's supposed to change us, and it's supposed to change us, well, we've got this new peace in our life, peace in our hearts, which is going to change everything. It's going to change our relationships, and we realize everything's changed because of Jesus Christ. We're stopping, say, supposed to say, thank you, Lord, for who, who you are and what you've done for us. And when you realize We've got Jesus. When you realize Jesus is in charge, when you realize Jesus is Lord, when you realize Jesus has redeemed us, any, any of these good things? When you realize, yes, no? When you realize that he's purchased us and he's forgiven us, all of a sudden we have this realization it doesn't matter what else happens. Ultimately, we have a relationship with Jesus Christ, and what we need to do is stop and be thankful because we realize we have an eternal relationship with Jesus Christ, and that changes everything. And so because of that, Paul can say, Let the peace of Christ, no, stronger than that, the peace of Christ must rule in your hearts. And it's going to affect your relationships one with another. And it also realizes, uh, tells us we've been reconciled and redeemed and forgiven, and for that we're supposed to be thankful. Again, I've got to show Paul elsewhere. Chapter 5 of the book of Romans. Notice the language. Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we also have obtained access by faith in this grace in which we stand and we rejoice. There's the thankfulness and the hope of the glory of God. We can be thankful because we realize, well, we've obtained access and faith to God. We can rejoice and be thankful because we've been justified. And no matter what happens to us, nobody can take that away from us. And so Paul reminds us, because of what Jesus Christ has done for you, don't be shaken. Because of what Jesus Christ has done for you, don't, don't live in fear. But actually let the peace of Christ rule over your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And let that guide our relationships because we realize we have an eternal relationship with God our Father. And this is great news. Let the peace of Christ rule in your life. And again, I just want to stop and say, don't you want peace? Do you want peace in your life? Well, he says, let that peace rule. Well, if you want that peace, he's going to go a little bit farther and tell us, how do you get that peace? Well, it's verse 16. The key to having peace in your life and in your heart and your relationship, the key to that actually comes with the next command. And he says that we've got to let the word of Christ dwell in you. In fact, let me just back up. If you want the peace of Christ ruling in your hearts, then you need to let the word of Christ dwell in you. And notice as we get down to verse 16. And let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another with all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And again, I've got to stop and remind you of that grammar lesson. This also is an imperative. This is a command. If you want the peace of Christ in your life, and you must have the peace of Christ in your life, how do you get that? Well, you've got to have the word of Christ dwelling in you. You want that peace? Let the word of Christ dwell dwell in you. Again, this command, an imperative. The word of Christ must dwell in your life. And so let me say it again. If you want the peace of Christ to rule in your hearts, you want that? You need the word of Christ in your life, specifically the gospel, the good news about Jesus Christ. That must dwell in your life. Now, an interesting word, this word dwell, it literally is the word, and we see that if we stop and contemplate the word dwell, what does that mean? It means to take up residence. It means to live in, right? Let me, let me kind of talk about the opposite. The word dwell, take up residency, this isn't a guest, this isn't a visitor. Now, around the holidays, a lot of times we have guests and visitors, right? And guests and visitors, they say, are kind of like fish. After three days, they stink, right? This isn't the word guest. This is not let the word of Christ be a guest in you. This is let the word of Christ dwell in you. It's got to take up residence. Now, just, just for example, it'd be pretty strange if you had somebody, you invited them over to dinner, and the first thing they did is start rearranging your furniture, right? That'd be a little strange. You have to be a resident there to have that right. Actually, I must be a guest in my own house, because I don't have that right. Only my wife has that right. <laughs> but, but Christ needs to come and be able to rearrange the furniture, He's supposed to, the word of Christ is supposed to dwell in you. That means he's got the right to make changes. He's going he's gonna to do some changing, He's supposed to come and dwell in you. Now, this is not just a temporary dwelling. This is a permanent dwelling. This is not just to invite Jesus in when it's convenient, or I'm going to invite him in during the holidays. I'm going to invite him over for a dinner or two. I'm going to invite him over when I'm in need or when it's convenient. The word of Christ must dwell in you. If you want the peace of Christ in your hearts, you've got to let the word of Christ dwell in you. He's got to do some rearranging. 
And it's going to affect how you live and how you respond. In fact, he's going to give us two rather interesting ways that if Jesus is dwelling in us, the word of Christ is dwelling in us, he's going to give us two evidences for that dwelling. And both of these have the indication that we want to share the dwelling of Jesus with other people. And so notice two evidences. Here's how I know the word of Christ is dwelling in you because you're willing to speak and admonish one another in all wisdom. If you've got the word of Christ dwelling in you, you're going to want to share that with others, and you're going to teach them and admonish them. Now, we look at those words, and we think those are hard words, like, I'm going to teach you a thing or two, or we look at that word admonish, like, I'm going to let you have it. Well, actually, no. Those aren't those words. In fact, let me just rewind just a little bit. Let's go back in chapter 3. How are we supposed to act as Christians? We put off the old self, we put on the new self, right? And so what does that teaching and admonishing look like? Well, just rewind. Here's context. Put on then compassionate hearts and kindness and humility and meekness and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against each other, forgiving each other. And above all, put on love. If you've got that, we realize we put those things on. Now we're supposed to be encouraging and teaching and admonishing and equipping and, and helping each other. And so uh, the, the, the teaching and admonishing he's talking about is not this harsh, look, I've got to tell you what it's supposed to be like. It's actually, we need to grow together. There's a difference there, right? You understand that? But if you've got the word of Christ dwelling in you, what you should be doing is wanting to help influence other people as well. And so one of the evidences of Christ and his word dwelling in you is you're wanting to do that in community, helping other people along the journey. And so one of the evidences, we really are supposed to be encouraging and helping and pointing people towards Jesus. And so the first evidence is teaching and admonishing. He goes on and gives a second evidence of what it looks like to have the word of Christ dwelling in you. And he's going to say, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, here's our word again, with thankfulness in your hearts to God. I want you to notice both these things are actually done in community. We're supposed to be encouraging and teaching and equipping other people, and we're supposed to be coming together and singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in our hearts to God. These are things, these are evidences. The word of Christ is dwelling in us, and so what are we doing? We're sharing the gospel. We're even singing the gospel. Some interesting words here I've got to stop and just talk about. Three things we're supposed to do. This is not a formula for the type of songs. This is saying we're supposed to come together and we're supposed to praise God. That word singing psalms, in Greek it is the word psalmoi. It does refer to those Old Testament psalms, which by the way, the word means accompanied by musical instrument. In fact, most of the psalms even tell us what instrument is supposed to be used. So singing psalms, though those are, are accompanied by musical instrument. We also get the word hymn there. Do we, do we even know what the word hymn is? Of course, it's the opposite of her. No, that's not, not it. The word hymn and we think of the great hymns of the faith, the word hymn literally means scripture put to music. And I've got to stop and, and, and just tell you something here. Uh, we, we hear this all the time. We wish you would sing more hymns. Actually, many, well, a hymn, if it's scripture put to music, some of our hymns have very little scripture in them, and some of our choruses are actually more hymnal or hymn-like than many of our hymns that aren't hymn-like. Does that make any sense to you at all? A lot of our choruses actually are simply this. They're scripture put to music. And so we're supposed to sing psalms. We're supposed to, uh, uh, we're supposed to sing scripture put to music and spiritual songs, which is just this element of spirituality to the music we sing. Paul's saying when we come together, we're supposed to praise God together. And really we're supposed to be singing scripture. And we're supposed to be singing, uh, singing about the glory of God and what he's done for us and things with a spiritual nature. And so when we come together, we're supposed to be doing this in community, singing praise to a great God together. Now, Scott's not here this weekend, and so make sure you don't tell him I said this. Man, we love Scott, and I don't know if you realize what Scott does every single week. He goes and he studies the passage that I'll be preaching. We work together about, okay, here's where I'm going, and I don't know if you know this, but every week he picks out songs and hymns and spiritual songs which are going to guide us. And if you look at the songs we sing They're based on the passage that we're going to study. He does a great job of choosing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs that come together to help us present the gospel message of Jesus Christ. That's what Paul's saying. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. And if you have the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, you need to understand that comes by letting the word of Christ richly dwell in you. It's taken up residence And that's evidenced by the fact that we're coming together and we're teaching and admonishing and encouraging each other and we're singing songs together about the greatness of God. He's saying, here's what that looks like. It's one body coming together, strengthening and encouraging and edifying and equipping and teaching and praising God and serving together, building each other up. 
And as we do that, we realize that's part of the key to letting the peace of Christ rule in our hearts. As the word of Christ dwells in you, as you're doing life together in community, it's not done in isolation. We're doing life together, and it'll help the peace of Christ rule in our hearts. You want peace? Well, let the word of Christ dwell in you. And he goes on, and actually, it's not in the form of a command, but it's a subjunctive but I'm going to phrase it that way because really it's meant to be taken this way. Let the peace of Christ rule in you and let the word of Christ dwell in you and let the name of Christ guide you. And it really does serve as a command. And whatever you do, notice that, whatever you do, and whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Whatever you do, whatever you're, you're doing at the moment, whatever your activities of life are, do that for God's glory. In fact, it doesn't say that. It says, do it in the name of the Lord. By the way, the word Lord means boss. He's in charge. I'm going to live my life as if he's in charge of me. But it also says not just the Lord Jesus. It also says, in the name of the Lord Jesus. What does that mean? What does it mean that we're going to do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus? Well, it means, well, it means I'm going to do things as if he wanted me to do them. In fact, we pray the same way. We always pray in the name of Jesus, Right? I pray this in Jesus' name. What does that mean when we pray in Jesus' name? It's not some magical formula. We're saying, okay, Jesus, in Jesus' name, amen, and somehow that's going to bless our prayer. When we say in Jesus' name, we're saying, Jesus, we want your will to be done. In fact, it is the very same thing that Jesus prays. Father, not my will be done, but your will be done. I want your name to be glorified. When we pray in Jesus' name, we're saying, Jesus, we want your name blessed. Jesus, we want your name to be advanced. Jesus, we want what you want. And so we're praying this in your name, that your name be glorified, that your name go forward, that your name be praised. And so the same thing's true here. Everything, whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. You're saying, Jesus, I want your name to be glorified. Actually, let me back up and rewind one more time. Names in the Bible had great significance. In fact, oftentimes, God would change a person's name because he had a job for them to do. And so he changed people's names. Even in the New Testament, he changed people's names. Like Simon becomes Peter, right? He changes names on purpose because those names were supposed to represent something. I've got to stop and say, do you realize that our names have also been changed? We wear the name Christ. We're called Christians. When people call you Christians, you're wearing the name of Christ. And you realize we're supposed to wear that name well. And here's what Paul says. Whatever you're doing, do that in the name of Jesus Christ. Do everything in the name of Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. We wear the name Christian. And I want to ask you, are you wearing that well? Are you wearing the name of Christian well? We wear the name of Christ. There's a story. You probably heard it. Alexander the Great, you know who that is, right? Great military conqueror. He was out riding through the battlefields one day, and the battle was intense, and he saw a young man running away from the battle. And he stopped the young man, and he said, Young man, what's your name? And the young man said, my name is Alexander. And Alexander the Great said, change your behavior or change your name. I want to tell you, that's what Paul is telling us as well. Do you realize you wear the name of Christ? When people look at you, they realize that you represent Jesus Christ. And so his challenge is, and whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Paul is saying, do you remember you wear the name of Jesus? Whatever you do, do it well because you wear the name of the Lord Jesus. And as we live, we need to stop and remember to give thanks in everything because we wear the name of Christ. You wear his name. You wear the name Christian it should change everything. Another story about a youth minister. His name was Guy King, and he went around doing youth rallies. And I, I love this, this story he tells. He says, years ago, I was leading a children's mission. As I approached, a little fellow, he caught sight of me and said, Mommy, here comes that Jesus man. He only meant that I was the man who spoke about Jesus, but his remark meant more to my heart that day. What right had I, have I, to be called a Jesus man? man what degree of resemblance is there about us i don't say that's the right question we wear the name christian what right 
do we have to wear the name Christian unless we're being molded and shaped and conformed to the image of Christ? And so Paul says, remember, you died to yourself. If you died to yourself, and you have, we're supposed to be putting off those old things. We're supposed to be putting on those new things. But even more than that, we're supposed to put on Christ. And Christ is supposed to change us. In fact, if we're being changed by Christ, we must let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts and our minds. And that peace of Christ should change our relationships. The reason why we can have this hope is because we're giving thanks for what God has done. We've got this eternal hope in Christ Jesus. Then we realize if we want the peace of Christ to rule in our hearts, we must have the word of Christ ruling in our hearts. And it's going to change us, and it's going to affect how we even do life together. And it reminds us in all areas to give thanks for who God is and what he's done and let the name of Jesus Christ guide us. And I simply want to ask the question, are you wearing his name well? Would you pray with me? Father, I want to come before you. Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the, the fact that we can have a peace It's even beyond our understanding. A peace that can guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. A peace that can can help us through terrible times. A peace that can change our relationships with one another because we realize we've got eternal hope in Jesus. And, And Father, help the word of Christ come and indwell us and change us and equip us and help us, well, help us teach and admonish and sing songs of praise one with another to become more like the people you've created us to be. And Father, in all of these things, Help us be guided by the name of Jesus Christ. And let us be thankful. That's my prayer. I pray this in the blessed name, the name of our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ.